Ladies and gentlemen, welcome along to another episode of EOTT in 2020 with me, Jimmy James. And today we are lucky enough to be joined by my brother, Paul Devlin. Paul, how are you? I'm very well, sir. How are you doing? I'm very well, sir. Thank you very much for asking. Uh, it's been a while since Paul and I have caught up. Now, some of you will know Paul. Um, some of you won't. For those of you who don't, Paul is um, a brother of mine who lives in the local area in Swindon. Uh, Quite an interesting character, I think it's fair to say. I won't give too much away. I think we'll let the story unfold, uh, you know, as it transpires. So, uh, as it is tradition on the podcast, Paul, tell us a little bit about yourself, brother, if you would, and uh, how you came to the uh, path that you currently find yourself on. Uh, well, for that, you kind of have to rewind about 25 years. Well, we've um, all the time in the world, brother, so, uh, yeah. That's good. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I basically, a friend of mine said, why don't you go and see a medium? I'd never done it before, um, really wasn't into stuff like that. And I thought, you know, I've got nothing to lose. So I went to see this medium and she said, oh, it's about time you, you turned up. And they're all, they're all saying, you know, where have you been? And that, that meeting was like a massive veil was lifted. Um, and once she sort of removed that block, I was able to um, feel spirit, his spirit it was almost immediate and i remember that that time or that next evening i had to i had to work and i was a, I was a taxi driver and i remember looking in my rearview mirror nobody being in the taxi but i knew it was crammed for the spirit so um that's basically where it began i then started to attend spiritualist church uh, started to advance a bit more um i then was almost too advanced to a point without being egotistical about it. And they actually asked me to leave um, the Spiritual Church, which is fair enough, I guess. Um, so I thought, well, you know, I'll just continue on my own path. Uh, and then I found myself, fast forward two or three years after sort of completely throwing myself into um, educating myself, you know, until... If, if, we, if we may, Paul, forgive me, if we may... <clears throat> Let's circle back to the spiritual church just briefly, if we may, because um, I remember before being taken to a spiritual church by a dear friend of mine, and some of the things that were going on there, they just didn't resonate. You know, I've done a lot. I've done a, at that point, I'd done a lot of research. I understood spirit, or spirit is not a word that some people like to use. You know, consciousness, all these other things. And uh, it seemed a bit, um, sh there was shenanigans afoot then, shall we say, with this particular spiritual church. And I think people were being hoodwinked a little bit. Is that kind of something you came across yourself or? Well, I basically, I was invited to, it was like they were all my best friend. It was very strange. And then I was invited to this open meditation circle. And it was the first okay. meditation okay. circle um, that I'd ever been involved with. So I went into meditation and what I saw was a, an Indian village um, with a couple of Indian children play fighting in sort of a, inside a rope ring. And a woman stood to the side, an Indian chief stood to the side. And when I came out and they said, what did you see, Paul? And I told them, and for some reason, they, they didn't agree with what I saw. They said, oh, you shouldn't be seeing things like that. And it was just like a, a baptist of fire. One person said, oh, I didn't like the energy coming from Paul. And then the next person said, oh, I didn't like that. And it sort of went round in a big circle. And at the end of the session, the teacher came up to me and said, I don't think you should come back. And I went, what, to the circle? And she went, no, to the church. I think oh, you should church. leave. So, um, so I was like, fair enough. See you later then. <laughs> there, I carried on studying. Um, I wasn't really sure where to go or who to talk to because uh, back then... The internet? People... Sorry? Was this pre-internet days? Yeah, pre-internet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and after that, I just was buying books and moving forward. I then moved to Manchester into a property where I found it to be extremely active. Um, knocks on the door, showers turning on and off at night. And I, although I'd, I'd sort of looked and read into this stuff, I really didn't know a lot about it. And the activity in the house got worse and worse. You know, books being thrown at my head, coming back from the pub, um, television turning themselves on and off, volume up and down. Really, really weird stuff. Uh, and when you live on your own in a house, it's quite a, a traumatic thing to go through. So I used to work as a, a cleaner part time, um, like a secondary job. And one night I was, I had my break in the canteen as always. And there was a little pink card on the notice board, and it said house healing so I picked the car up um, phoned the number 
And this lady said, you know, uh, you've got some issues. I'll, I'll talk you through it. She never actually came round to my house, but she talked me through how to deal with this situation. And I remember going through each and every room, um, doing a little prayer with the candle. And the most amazing thing was when I, she said, the last thing you need to do is open the front door and stand by the front door. And you actually felt this thing leave. This right. thing, um, you know, whisk of air that went past me. And when that happened, I thought, do you know what? I need to stop doing all, you know, being a chef and all these other things. I need to, I'd like to do, I'd like to do that. And it was just like a life changing moment. Um, so then on, when I, I returned from Manchester to Reading, started up my own paranormal group. Uh, that went on then into Spirit Rescues. From Spirit Rescues, then went on to do some talks and a bit of radio. Uh, and then I had a, an incident with a guy I was working with who became possessed. Um, I didn't really, I only knew one chance to sort of get this guy or presence out of him. And when that happened, I thought I need to go online because we're fast forwarding now about 15 years to find out how to how to become an exorcist if it was indeed possible. And uh, it was, and that's obviously I then trained on speaking to you now as a Buddhist exorcist. So, yeah. So, yes, we have fast forwarded a little bit. So let's circle back if we may, and we'll get a little bit more kind of uh, into the into the kind of details of, of the journey. So was there a specific moment um, in the early days when you thought, yeah, I've made the right decision here. This is my path. I found my calling kind of thing. You know, beyond actually you know, past the day when the, uh, the spirit or the consciousness left the property and you thought, right, I need to change my path. Was it then like confirmation milestones and things like that for you? I, I think for me, because back then there was no paranormal groups or anything like that. So I yeah. was totally on my own. Um, when I came back to Reading, I was so focused on what I wanted to do to he then help people in the situations that I'd been in. Um, but I was also very conscious of the idea that I needed to um, get my knowledge up. So the best way to do it is to experience it, right? Um, yeah. And my first investigation was me and my friend. It was quite scientific. He was a very scientific based and we did it at a, at a train station. Um, which was, well, quite, quite well known for being haunted. Uh, you know, we, was it days we, local suicide spot as well? Yeah, as, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah Tyler's train station. And um, so I, I, I took some basic bits of equipment with me and got some really good stuff. And it sort of grew from there. And I think from that point on, once you start to get evidence, and once you start to experience things, see things and feel things, then it's a case of it eggs you on. Um, not only do you want to, you then think to yourself, well, how can I help these souls? Because they, if they had the choice, they wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of my way of thinking. And then it was kind of sort of getting over that hurdle. Well, I can barely communicate, let alone help. So I really, it was, it was a real sort of test of um, education for me and how would I indeed handle it? Because these things can be very full on when they want to be. So it was a, it was a long process of, you know, of doing investigations. Then I, I sent a random text off to the BBC. Um, you know, this is what I'm doing and ended up doing a guest spot once a month, which was, which was really good for the group because um, more and more people joined. Yeah. And then you sort of, I fell into trouble again because I had a group of 15 people. Were you infiltrated, Paul? <laughs> Sorry? Were you infiltrated, the group? Was the group infiltrated? It Were wasn't infiltrated. Like groups and things like that? Like, well, you... it wasn't infiltrated, but I think the BBC realised that this, this group had legs. Um, oh, one sorry. of the producers used to come out with me on the ghost hunts and one of the radio presenters used to come out with me as well. Um, and it was all going really well. And then this guy um, decided, who was a, a governor of a school and also a very religious person, decided he didn't like what I was doing and went to the papers and started phoning up the BBC day in, day out, 
I ended up being thrown off the BBC and having my name slammed all over the papers. I had no way of sort of defending myself at the point or that time. And the teachers that were in my group were threatened with their jobs if they didn't leave the group. Um, and I remember there was a head teacher and uh, his wife, a deputy head teacher, and they both phoned me up or she phoned me up in tears saying, I'm really sorry. I love what I do with you guys, but I've got to leave because if I don't, I will lose my job. And this is the kind of, you know, control that, that, that people have, you know, that they're scared of what they don't understand or don't want to understand more importantly. Um, and you're sort of... Um, <clears throat> Um, listeners, I do apologise for the uh, the echo back. I hope this isn't too uh, difficult on the ears. But I think it's an important dis distinction to make there, Paul, and I'm glad you did. There's a difference between um, being afraid of the unknown and then there's the, those who don't even want to know. Just don't even tell me. I don't even want to know. I've got my internal understanding, internal vision. I, I know what I know and that's all I need to know. And I don't want to know anything else. And I think, they, you know... Some people go, oh, what's all this then? This all sounds a bit strange. And then, you know, there's a kind of a little bit of a spectrum, but there's kind of, uh, yeah, definitely two sides to it for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the important thing is, is that you have to learn to stand up to people because if you, if you don't, um, then they'll just, they'll just push back and push back and push back and push back. And I think what happened with this particular problem, they thought that it would all end for me if I was taken off the airwaves, shut down by the papers. And yeah, I wasn't given every, anything for two years. Nobody called me into their house or anything. It really did affect it, but I never stopped. Yeah, and then yeah. slowly after time, it began to build up. But when things started to build up again, the BBC came back to me and said, oh, would you like to um, come back on air? And I went, no. Um, and every year for the next five years, they asked me. So the, the bigger the name that they thought that they would have to come and interview me, the more lure that they thought that would get me into the studio. But it never worked. And just recently, I was invited by a BBC local um, here, and I spoke to them and then basically said, look, no, I'm not going to do it. What's the old expression? Fool me once, shame on, uh, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I think it's important that we stick to our guns because it, it's very easy. You know, with social media now, you can get your message out there. You don't need you don't you don't need big corporations to do it for you. Are they dead? I think Paul, aren't they? These big corporations, you know, the they're American, on the way out, definitely. They're on the definitely. yes, they're on the way out. That's a better way to put it. Thank you. Yeah, it's certainly the American corporations, and I think so many people now are waking up to the fact that you know, TV licensing is a scam. We know we don't have to get into it, but we know about all the shenanigans that have gone on there in the headquarters, the people who are affiliated. You know, stuff speaks for itself, and I think yes, alternative media, as it's been called, um, or just someone came up with a really good um, expression for it the other day, and this is, it escapes me right now, but it, it, it related to the same thing. The social media, the alternative media, is now becoming the main source, the main source for, uh, you know, a lot of people just to get their um, get their information and finding out what's going on on the ground level. These institutions have just been shown to be completely unreliable, completely biased, and completely unfit for purpose, I think. It's fair to say, no? Quite, quite Absolutely. Fair. And I, I think, I mean, the one of the main guys who now reads uh, main, well, he, he does the news on Radio 4, um, a guy called Andrew Peach. Um, he was, we, we had arranged to do um, a investigation at one of the BBC had, one of the BBC main ports um, at that time. And it was given the go ahead and we all turned up there to do this investigation and I don't I don't do them anymore if people call me uh, into a private house I'll go and do it but I don't I don't purposely go and do big buildings anymore just for the sake of ego it's, it's pointless. Yeah. Expert, you know so too many people are doing it now um, and we turned up with our little group and this guy this Andrew Peach bloke had just he just cut it no nope. so I'm there with my group made me look um, unorganized and security guard just said no well he said no and that's it but yet two days before um they they'd approved it um so the big man 
at that corporation at that building turned around and said no which is his right and that's fine He's probably However, one of the problems. he was probably worried what you'd find Paul huh just, well uh, there, there was many there are there are many you speak to a lot of people who used to be in that building um I mean there was a there was a gravestone out the back of the um studio and there was lots of noises and bangs that weren't normal to that building that's very important when you say gravestone, Paul is that indicative of it being a very old building is that what you're alluding yeah, to there? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um I don't know how old the building is. The, the, that the BBC aren't there anymore. I don't know who, who now inhabits it, but I do specifically remember the Garrett Gravestone being outside a very old one um, outside the studios. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh well, I'm sure it was probably all um, kind of set in set in motion for a reason, and that wasn't meant to be your path because you kind of you've progressed down a different kind of route. So where did you kind of go from there, Paul? I know you did. Um, the Ghost Hunter stuff, the radio show, is that a little bit more recent or because I would like to if we can and if you'd, if you'd rather not, it's not a big issue but I thought considering we've got you on, on, on the, on the programme, on the channel you and I are kind of personal friends and we have discussed uh, on nights out, probably on a bit of a whistleblower narrative and, and again you can go into it as deeply or as, as not as shallowly if the right word as you like but the whole thing of when you were working for the ambulance service and just that on the ground experience of how you saw it being dismantled, privatized, contracted. And can we cover that a little bit, please? Was yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah lovely. Thank you. So where was that on the narrative? I don't want to kind of jump from back and forwards to you. You tell it how you like, but you know. I mean, from from the BBC. I mean, we um, I probably am the service of about five years away, maybe eight okay. years away from well, that. that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, from there, I probably about. Probably, it was probably about two or three years later I, I got married um, and we moved um, to the area that we're now in. And from that point, um, I was lucky enough to be given an opportunity to create my own paranormal radio show um, with a local radio station, which was independent from any big corporations. So from that, I met a lot of people um, who also gave me a lot of knowledge, as well as continuing to do spirit rescues, um, teaching psychic circles. And the, the more time went on, the more jobs I was called to, um, the, the more intense they got and the more activity they got. So I started doing talks and seminars and things like that just to see who would come. Uh, and it, it's just... At that point, when you sort of reach the point of, I think it was, we're now, I think 2013 that was, uh, I had to then stop doing the show because I got myself a job at the ambulance service. Right, okay. If I can just uh, jump in quickly, Paul. Um, for the benefit of the listeners and a recap for myself, if you'd be so kind, talk us through what is a spirit rescue and if you can, one of your more memorable kind of experiences of the kind of spirit rescue episode. Okay, right. Well, spirit rescue is something for, is exactly what it says on the tin. You are rescuing a, a spirit or a soul from a traumatic, um, from a traumatic incident. So for example, for those of you who uh, have seen the film Sixth Sense, it's kind of uh, very real to that where the main character you don't know until the end is actually oh, dead and he doesn't really spoiler alert spoiler alert it's an old film i'm sure most people have seen it by now i just yeah yeah, yeah. Thank you, so if you if you are not prepared for death so if you are in a, a car accident plane crash anything like that like that and it's a very quick impact it's said that your soul is not ready to leave its body so it, it, it because it's because of the shock of the impact of it um, the wavelengths will kind of trap it. So it's kind of like an energy field that stops it going anywhere. So then that soul is then trapped on the earth plane for as long as the earth plane is here. And until somebody comes along or, and, and helps that soul over to where it needs to go, it will keep either reliving that or it will just keep living year after year after year after year. Um, which is actually quite a scary thing. If you imagine being stuck in Groundhog Day for forever. 
you know, reliving the what same makes, thing. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that, brother. What it makes me think of, Paul, is um, some parts of the world, and in times gone by, it would have probably been uh, a lot more, uh, it would have been quite similar um, across a larger swathe of the, the, the landmass, would have been this kind of tribal society where you had your, you know, shaman is a word that's used quite a lot now, and I think some people kind of dislike the word shaman, but I'll use the word because that's what most people understand, but your shaman type characters within the groups would have covered certain geographical landmasses. So if someone were to be, you know, uh, killed by surprise by a crazy monkey or a tiger, whatever it is, or that traumatic death, if that soul was trapped within that energetic field in that area, maybe a hunter would see it or notice it or the shaman would notice it. And I imagine that would be their job then to do exactly what you do, the spirit rescue, the help of the transformation over. But being in the kind of Western civilized, civilized society, when these things happen, there's nobody really around to recognize or even to be in tune to see. Um, so I think, am I right in saying that kind of exorcist, no, sorry, um, poltergeists and all that kind of narrative are um, these kind of spirit souls trying to get attention to be able to get over to the other side. Yeah, I mean, some of, well, poltergeist activity uh, comes on, in my experience, two different levels. Right. Um, most people who experience poltergeist activity will associate it with negative, which, which I'm sure Western society would love because it's all negativity. Uh, and you get, you know, um, things being thrown around, banging, crashing, slamming the doors, um, just scaremongering, basically. Um, now, they are either called in by humans, uh, by Ouija boards, things like that. They don't just appear. Uh, you know, poltergeists are not. Um, basically, poltergeist is German for mysterious spirit. Um, so polter and geist. Mm -hmm. um, and basically... The, the thing is with poltergeist activity, because it's that violent, people want to feed on that negativity. And what, pol what poltergeists normally do will affect girls that go through puberty oh, because right. their emotions are all over the place right. uh, in the nicest possible way. And obviously that's easy to feed off. So poltergeist will use that energy. And normally when I go to poltergeist um, investigations, when people call me in, um, you will normally find they have a 12, 13 or 14 year old girl. Um, the other side of poltergeist activity is the happier side, the nicer side. Um, probably one of the nicest cases was a garden machinery place in Wales. Uh, he had his own um, business and they all used to, fix a little lawnmowers. And one day they're in their shed and the guy goes, oh, I wish I had a nut. I can't find the right nut to tighten this up. And a nut that he needs flies across the floor onto the bench. Oh, great. I don't know how that got there. Great. So they started to experiment. Oh, keys. And they called this guy Pete the Poltergeist. And so that was a very friendly and helpful um, mischievous spirit and he was mischievous but in a nice way but of mm -hmm. course people only want to talk about the negativity they only want to talk about the bad stuff they never want to give good positive um, experiences but of course you're not going to get called into those houses because those kind of those people are happy with that but there again the problem is um, it's not about what it might sound a little bit strange. It's not always about what people want. You have to do what's right for the spirit soul that's trapped here. It doesn't belong here. It needs to go yeah, back yeah. to source, to where it come from. That's not the people who live in those houses. It's not their decision to make. Now, I'm not here to play God when people say to me, oh, because you're a spirit rescuer, therefore you are making that decision. No, I'm being contacted by... Um, a family who's been made aware of this thing because it wants to go home. It wants, it wants to go back. Otherwise, you wouldn't hear it. And that very much happens. With, it's, it, it's a common thing with poltergeist activity. It's, uh, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. It's not a very um, endearing prospect, is it, to be trapped within what I imagine must be visually in physical plane, but not tactic 
what's the word? Tactile senses. You're not you're not actually able to engage it, or they have to kind of conjure up enough energy to be able to break through the veil to engage, or maybe writing your name in steam on the mirror as a poltergeist. I imagine would take or a spirit maybe just have your poltergeist far less energy than to launch a cup from one side of the room to the other what can you tell us about that kind of being able to break through the veil so to speak to engage between the two sides how, how does that come about is there any kind well, of um methodology or understanding behind it do we have yet or there, there is i mean if you if you fail if you if you can't get through people often say to me why can't they get through um because they don't have the knowledge or the ability it's like trying to find your way in fog yeah you know? um if you find a light beacon then you can find your way through it it's like them permanently being trapped in fog so wherever you look it's the same fog so whichever direction you go you're not going to be able to do it so what the important thing here is is to educate people in the fact that when spirit are trapped then you need to lift the fog for them because they are not capable. And that's, that's the key to it. Get people to understand that, that level of how to help them and how you get, how you, re, how you remove that fog. Um, you, you have to turn detective. It's not just a case of you can't go around and just go rescuing spirits here, there and everywhere. Um, there are, I'll, I'll just explain on most sites um, around the country you will have a spirit guardian of the site so a house with that or the land will have a spirit guardian um, i went to a place called pluckley which is supposedly meant to be one of the most haunted um, villages in england and somebody had removed the guardian of the site of a place called St. mary's church which was hit by a doodle bug in world war ii um, and when I was called down to put a new um, guardian of the site in or bring the old one back, um, it was a difficult thing because people had gone in there, paranormal groups had gone in there, um, all egotistical, oh, I can get rid of this spirit. And of course, it was a guardian of the site. And people say, well, how do you know the difference? Quite easy. The guardian of the site is a guardian, and that's its job. It's there to protect and attract soul need to rescue it. Need, it hasn't a purpose on this plane. It may have a purpose once um, sort of um, gone gone over to the light or whatever you want to call it, but that's somebody else's call to make, not mine. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Oh, so they've gone in there, amateur hour, and uh, dismissed, <laughs> dismissed the guardian of the site. That's never a good thing. Never a good thing. So um yes thank you paul i remember we talked about the particular incident that occurred during one of your i think it was a spirit rescue where you kind of realized to yourself oh okay this could be dangerous and you had to kind of decide about up in your game so to speak and go on and doing training at what point in the narrative did that kind of occur that yeah um Good question. I, there was a point we were called to a house um, in Winchester. It was a very old, old um, Victorian house. And the children had died in a fire um, at, from, a, from, a, from a different time. And everybody was being affected and haunted. And the, the parents, one parent died, the other one survived. But we're talking like 200 years on between each visit, if you like. And the father that was trapped there, um, I sent the two children over and the father decided that he didn't want to then go over. So wherever I went, I couldn't get hold of him. So it made it very difficult for me. Some of the techniques I was using weren't working. Right. So eventually, after about two hours, I, I did send him over. But I then realized that I needed a bit more. I needed to up my game. So again, I went away, trained. I watched stuff online. Um, I, I spent a lot of time with some, found some very um, good spirit rescuers around the country. Uh, went with them on, on, on jobs, on investigations. 
started to sort of help and make my own spirit rescue um, sort of case studies up and, and write my own book, if you like, to try and use different techniques that would work. And then that's probably a period of about 18 months that I kind of up my game a bit. And once that happened, I started being called to more serious instances and it's basically gone on from that. It's every, every, every job you go to, they will always say it's the worst thing they've ever seen because they've never experienced it before. But from my point of view, the spirit rescue cases that I've been dealing with in the last five years, have become more and more violent and more and more difficult to, um, to solve. Because we live in a world now that has a lot more electricity, which they feed on, uh, which is energy. And we live in a world that is a very, very busy, stressful place. And they can feed on that as well. So it becomes, you have to up your game because they've up theirs. Um, there are more traumatic, there are more traumatic um, deaths, there are more suicides, there are more cases of um, violence in in spiritual attacks as well, which needs um, a broader knowledge, if you like. You can't just be a paranormal investigation group and go in and go, oh, yeah, you've got that problem. Well, yeah, that's why we called you because I know I've got a problem in my house. I want it solved. And I'm not saying that all paranormal groups are like that, but a lot of times when I go into houses and do what I do, it's because they've called somebody in, a group of people, um, a lot of the time, don't really know what they're doing. Uh, I'd also like to say at this point, a medium is not a spirit rescuer. A medium is a communicator from spirit to the people around. They often find themselves in a situation that they can't handle and try to rescue it and find themselves in problem, get themselves in problems themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you do have an issue in you, with your house, what I would say is research the people in the area that can, that can help you. Don't just grab, drop grass straws and go for the first person. You'll be drawn to the per people that you know, or that you think that can help you the most. Talk to them, answer them, answer, ask them questions. And more importantly, um, make sure that they're insured. Because the last thing you want is paranormal people running around your house breaking stuff um, who don't have respect for many things. And again, that's not every group because there are some very groups, out, very, very good groups out there. But unfortunately, in this day and age, they watch Most Haunted and everybody wants to be a paranormal investigator. And it takes a long time to train to have the knowledge that you need to solve some of these problems. Uh, and the way that it's done can affect not just the spirit it's the families that you go to help as well you can go home and have your cup of tea at the end of the day and put your feet up and write your book or whatever you want to do but those people still have to live with that trauma and that's why i'm a little bit different because i deal with the trauma with family afterwards as well as try and solve their paranormal pro um, problem or their spiritual issues Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> We're just talking about the, the um, changing world and the elements that um, I suppose you could say providing more conducive conditions for these <clears throat> excuse me, spirits to come through. And my understanding of it is it is an electrical universe. Um, and when you look at these kind of old uh, demonic sigils and symbols it all seems like electrical wiring diagrammatic kind of symbols and things like this so there's something that's um, I've looked into a little bit but not a massive deal but what did you think uh, the first time you saw that Hasbro saw Ouija boards to kids as board games I hang my head because all it's right. just it's no accident, Paul. Is it? It's no accident. No, it, it's um, it was the number. I mean, it was the number one best-selling board game um, in I think 2013, 2014, 2015. I think we did some research on it when I was doing the Outer Limits, 
and it is ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous the the how dangerous is that so you have to be 16 to have cigarettes sold to you 18 to buy alcohol or you know 25 to be served in a shop or wherever it is but you can go and buy a hasbro um a ouija board game at five years old and nobody questions you because it's not real, Paul. None of it's real, you know. That's that yeah. is the general consensus, isn't it? And that's that's all been done by design, you know. We talked about it the other day, the witch trials. Um, in my five article, uh, an article in my five rather. Um, Andy Lewis shared it. He's a he's a whistleblower. But the thing was talking about um, from the inception of these military intelligence services. That was all in um, in cahoots with the Vatican and these kind of witch trials and. Try to kill all the, all the, uh, you know, the witches, the wizards, the warlocks, anyone with any kind of extrasensory kind of abilities, were all just kind of um, killed off. But there's a few of us I think really who've kind of managed to slip through the cracks. So there's, there's that meme, we're the descendants of the witches you couldn't burn, and I love that one. It really resonates. I, I, I think, I mean, which, well, I don't say witchcraft, but spirituality wasn't made legal in this country to 1951. So if you look back on it, you know. That's actually not that far ago. It's not that long ago. It's the same with homosexuality, isn't it? You know, you get locked up for being homosexual. Yeah. So th th this this is the thing. This is how crazy it, it is. And even now today, with all the things and all the awareness there is around, people are still being, as you, you talked about earlier, people are still being sent to infiltrate groups, um, break them up, and you know cause massive amounts of, of of problems and especially in paranormal groups again the, the, there always seems to be one person that wants to stand in front of the camera and do the stuff which is great but there's already somebody waiting in the wings and they kind of forget what they're here to do they're here to help and educate as far as i'm concerned um, those groups should be helping people educating people and sharing their knowledge and it really unfortunately there are more that don't than do. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And that segues us in nicely to my next kind of point, which is um, you we talked about um, spirituality being illegal. And I, you know, mentioned homosexuality just to kind of highlight the uh, the absurdity of the whole thing and what we find ourselves now, even now, although we we're behind the curve as an island in the UK, and that's because of all these corrupt politicians. But we are seeing now, even in America, a lot of the states are legalizing cannabis, um, psilocybin, psychedelic mushrooms, and all this kind of stuff. Now, again, it, when, when we do eventually get to uh, the point where, you know, all these things change, we will look back with absurdity at how, who decided that we cannot put molecules and plants into our body to change our consciousness, to explore our own minds? Who decided that that was illegal? Again, this will all play into the narrative. But also, I think it's fair to say that the substances, whether it be psychedelic mushrooms, DMT and all these things. And I've read a lot about crystal methamphetamine being um, a doorway for demonic influences, which I can believe because some of the people who did some of the most heinous, crazy things when I was uh, serving my prison sentence was generally through crack or crystal meth. So I think it does. You put enough of that into that into your you know your bioenergetic body, you do open yourself up. But um. I made an introduction, Paul, with regards to our, I've been given permission to share, but we won't, we won't allude to too many personal details, but the, the couple who were um, exploring their minds using DMT and were then having a lot of bother, a lot of influence, a lot of bad dreams, a lot of interference. And it turned out that when you went there, portals had been left open where um, breakthrough experiences had been occurring, entity contact, these kind of things. But due to the lack of knowledge or the lack of understanding of how the structure of reality works and all these other things, uh, it seemed to be that doorways were left open. I think, is that fair to say, Paul? Doorways? Yeah, yeah. Portals, doorways, um, spiritual elevators, call them what you want. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason that this happens is because when you... Um, I've worked with quite a few people who, who've taken, taken drugs, and what happens is that... Um, that is definitely it heightens your your consciousness there's no question about it, it does heighten your consciousness but our minds are already, our minds are all, always trying to protect us so although our consciousness heightens up 
um, our mind goes and shifts into a different state. Um, and then things that are spiritual, demonic, or from other dimensions find a way to get to get in. You know, if you bombard if you bombard somebody with a hundred things, you know, um, you might have a good umbrella, but two or three drops are going to get on you, and that's all it can take. That's all it needs. And um, with those two or three drops, it can infiltrate. Um, and once they're inside, you know, they're very very difficult to get out. You only have a certain amount of time, in my experience, to get those things out before that person is lost as a person. They will still go on living, but it's the infiltration that is the dangerous part of it. And to have those portals and those things open leaves you exposed to that. Not I'm saying it not happens to everybody, but um, on people who have those levels, who have taken, taken those drugs, that does happen. Um, I'm not here to judge anybody. I'm here to solve problems. No, oh, this is oh, it. Of course, it's all about education and kind of coming together and sharing our knowledge so that we can go forward and learn from each other's mistakes on the shoulders of giants and all that kind of jazz. And uh, yeah, thank you, brother. Now, <clears throat> speaking of, are we are we allowed to mention the the five D wizard story? Because I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I took I took part. I, actually, I took part in one of his. Um, online healing sessions last night he invited oh, okay um and uh, that was very interesting so yeah we can talk about we can talk about the the 5d right awesome so come on now we'll just have a quick in a quick aside if you if we can i know this was quite recent but as seen as we're kind of on this narrative how did that come about paul i think you were reached out to right is that is that correct yeah i had a phone call um from a lady who came to one of my uh, talks or used to listen to the radio show and um, she put me in touch with this this guy's mum. I had a phone call with her. Uh, they live in Spain. They agreed to fly him over uh, so I could I could go and talk to him. And um, I drove to Basildon to meet this guy. And he probably the most interesting case I've had in a long, long time because it was most people would turn around and say, oh, really split split personality. I think believe in a split personality at all i think that split personalities come from somebody if you're channeling somebody else um you can't just blame it and give somebody a you know a drug and say it'll be all right now um because you're not don't, you're not dealing with a problem I but, that, yeah. uh, he he was very um very very interesting character because he he, he called himself or introduced himself as a wizard from 5d and he used the wizard voice. And I remember going in, his mum said, oh, would you like a cup of tea? Yes, please. Would you like milk and sugar? Well, I had a little bit of milk, uh, admittedly, and a little bit of sugar. And he immediately said, oh, you're a Buddhist, yeah, you're a Buddhist priest, Buddhist exorcist. You shouldn't be having milk. It's, it, you know, it's a, it's a toxin. I said, well, Buddha tried milk. He tried alcohol and he tried meat. It's all about moderation. And he sort of looked at me and didn't say anything else. Um, and then he kept changing his voice and I said, look, when you, when, when, when we talk together, I don't want you to talk to me in a wizardy voice, talk to me in your normal voice. You can still channel, but we can do it that way. And he had a, a demonic attachment to him, um, which I've cleared. And he does a lot of teachings, a lot of teachings online. He's very, very, um, very, very out there. I mean, he channels three or four people. So one minute he's himself, then he's the wizard, then he's something else. But he's been tested by five or six, you know, um, psychologists, psychotherapists, whatever you want to call them. And they've all said he's of sound mind, you know. So, and he, he took uh, DMT and it totally opened him up. But... I really do believe that's his purpose. He's here to he's here to teach people. He's here to help people. You know, his mum and dad can't out, can't understand it. They're at their wits' end. Um, but he's doing a lot of good. He's teaching. He's healing, uh, and he wants to help people. And because I helped him, he wants to sort of help me, if you like. So 
are agreed to take part in one of these webinars uh, last night, which was very, very interesting. Um, and I'll probably do one a month just to look in and just for research purposes, I think. Uh, but yeah, he's a fascinating guy. Um, things happen for a reason. That's it, yeah, if you hit the nail on the head there, Paul, everything does happen for a reason, I think. And just based from my own kind of personal experiences and facilitating experiences where people have had entity contact and stuff, stuff that, you know, and it's, if you don't know anything about it, you'd just, you'd be forgiven for just completely disregarding it because it is out there. It is kind of uh, a little bit incredible. But um, yeah, that particular story, I remember when we kind of, you, you first told me about it. And uh, yeah, I think perhaps, you know, I think we all we all definitely come here with a purpose, and through circumstance um, and things like this, I think some of us get lost on different paths, and our energies get you know funneled and channeled into things that, that weren't really in, uh, weren't really our initial intention. And sometimes it takes that kind of experience, whether it's a a traumatic near death car crash or a divorce at 40 or there can be all these different things smoking DMT what it's, it's just these different little kind of um, catalysts I guess that kind of help to knock us back onto the path because that is kind of how the universe works I personally found anyway you know you might have missed this you might have missed the last turn in but there'll be another one coming up shortly and we'll get you back onto that kind of path so I I kind of like that but yeah thank you brother and so so speaking of paths then let's kind of um, circle back if we may because we were kind of I think we were about five years before the ambulance service when we, before we kind of diverged down this. Yeah, yeah. Um, five years before the ambulance service, as I said, I, I was still doing my um, spirit rescues and it, it, it kind of sort of, you know, I was, I was working a regular job um, and doing the, the radio show, the Outer Limits radio show, which I was um, asked to create. And as I said, there was many people on that show that I got into contact with who I'm still in contact with and learn an awful lot from. Uh, it, it's an amazing thing. And I'm sure you'll, you'll understand this, Jimmy, that when you do things like this, you meet incredible people and you learn so much. Your knowledge base is going right through the roof. Um, and these are why well, these things are so brilliant to do. And by doing that, it gave me so much more knowledge, so much more um, information than I would have had. And it kind of went on down that line for a while uh, until I got the job or applied for the job for the ambulance service, uh, got it and unfortunately I had to stop doing the radio show because of the hours that I was, I was, I was doing. Um, so I couldn't commit every week to two hours on air. Thank you brother, I appreciate that. So um, we were talking about the, the the degradation then, you know, we've seen all these different elements of society through kind of government initiatives, privatization, uh, and all these other kind of elements that we've seen that things have just kind of decayed and crumbled, or it would appear in the interests of, you know, a very small group of people, family lines, et cetera, et cetera, who seem to be benefit, benefiting from it. Can you give us just a little insight into how you saw things kind of um, decaying and degrading from the, the start of your time there to the end? Yeah, absolutely. The major kind of, you know, the, the major incidences of you thought, you know what, this is just not right. Because you've told me a few things, you know, we've interested. I, I, I think yeah. the, when we, I mean, the, there was a private company that came in and took over the patient transfer stuff. Um, and when you were with the, what I call proper ambulance service, they had all the right stuff, all, all the right equipment on the wagons that you needed to cover for every eventuality, every eventuality. Um, and I use this word, these monkeys came in, put um, a ridiculous bid into parliament for six million pound for the contract, for the patient transfer contract. Um, it was accepted. And the whole thing just went downhill from there. They didn't have any defibrillators, any life-saving equipment uh, on board. They had umbrellas and a wheelchair, which to me, I remember doing, um, we had to do training, which I found hysterically funny. And the, we all said, everybody that had been sort of 2 would over from the National Health Service or NHS to this private company, what, what on earth is an umbrella going to be used to? Oh, you can, you know, when it's raining, 
Well, you have to push the wheelchair. And um, by the way, where's the defib on the bus? Oh, you've got a pair of bands you can use, you know, use CPR. Well, yeah, that's only effective for two minutes and then you get rather tired. Um, and it was just the whole lack of understanding, lack of knowledge and lack of patient care. Um, so many patients were let down by um, the National Health Service um, because they were trying to save money. But I'm sure a lot of people lost lives um, during that time. And being in the job that I do now, um, it's quite difficult to when you're trying to sort of help save somebody and you, you're quite very aware of the, the, the spiritual light on the other side, you know, that's quite difficult when you walk into a hospital and there's all these people wandering around, you think, which one's real and which ones aren't? Mm. You know? So I, I think the, the, the trouble with the, the downfall of it was the fact that people wanted to save money. Um, but nobody really cared about the, nobody really cared about the people. You know, I tried to care for those people and you do what you can, but it, it, it wasn't enough. And it got to the point where, you know, I, I joined the job to make a difference, but in the end you, you can't make the difference that you want to make the difference. You can't do, you can't do that extra level of care that you, you want to do. So we, we took one lady home one day, um, nine o'clock at night. Uh, she was 90 years old, lived on her own. I remember putting the boiler on for her, the kettle on for her. Um, we made her, the, it was me and another guy made her a cup of tea, sat her in a little chair, put some blankets over her. Her carer was not due until the next morning. She's just come out of hospital, lives on her own. And you have to leave that person knowing that they're probably going to be back in hospital the next day. And they shouldn't have been discharged in the first place. You know, so the whole thing is based on money, but the people who make the decisions have not been in that situation or haven't even evaluated it. So, so far removed from reality that, uh, yeah, it's the same. yeah, it's the same. We've seen this uh, across the spectrum, across all the boards, you know, and you raise a good point there, Paul. The majority of people, they do go into these roles. And it's not just the ambulance service. There are, you know, different things, police, et cetera, with the best of intentions. The majority, you know, they do want to make a difference. And then you realize, oh, actually, this wasn't actually designed for that. Well, maybe it was at one point, but um it does seem to be that, uh, yeah, those who uh, hold the purse strings, make the decisions, have the control, are just so far removed from any kind of reality. It's, uh, it's no wonder we're in the, in the situation we're in. I've, and the other thing, but I'm glad I went through that situation. We were talking about paths earlier, weren't you? Um, that was my path. That's my path to going there, experience, get, get the experiences, make more connections um, from those people. Uh, work colleagues, etc. I, I, some I still know today, which then gave me the confidence to come out and continue doing the work and realise at a point, well, hang on, hang on a minute, there actually might be a, a call for what I'm doing on a full time basis, uh, and that kind of that that set the seed definitely. Uh, when I came out of the ambulance service, it definitely set the seed because I thought I don't want to be going from job to job for the rest of my life doing things that aren't going to make a difference. Yes. It, might say it, on the, it might say it on the packet, but once you open the packet and there's nothing in there, you think, well, yeah, I've been, you know, I've been sold down the road. Yes. No, I, I hear that, but then, uh, you know, you are definitely here to make a difference. That's for sure. So ambulance service, where did things progress from there, my brother? What happened next? Well, I, I, I decided to do a, like a, a mini, a mini tour. So I took my footage and all the things that all the investigation I'd, I'd done and started to, to show them to, you know, little conference centers and stuff like that. And, and people, people came and it was brilliant. Um, from there on, I uh, recruited this, this, this guy called, uh, we'll call him R. And 
he was one of these guys that you meet are, that's just in immensely talented um in in the spiritual sense you know he had an ability to communicate with uh spirit and we we did a, a few he came with me on a, on a couple of sort of spirit rescues and would take the form of that spirit so it was almost like a transmedium if you get but on a, a more intense level okay um and we then um we were invited to do uh, something at the Wyvern Theatre in Swindon uh, and although I hadn't done any investigations on that level for a long time because I, I sort of stayed away from it we we had been asked by the radio station to cover this this particular um, this particular theatre because um, when I left the ambulance station uh, service I sort of rejoined the radio station but quite it was quite loosely I didn't have a show um, but I was still in contact. So um, they they said, you know, if we come to the radio station and have a chat with you about the things that go on in the theatre, would you come and investigate it? So, uh, okay, fair enough. So they came to the radio station, told me about the things that were going on. I arranged uh, for a small group to go down. Uh, Simon Monday, uh, who used to do the Outer Limits with me, and uh, is a very good paranormal investigator, uh, very respectful, very knowledgeable, and R, who was uh, the transmedium. So we went to this theatre, and this was the night where, again, everything changed for me, again for life. And we did the, the front of the theatre, which was brilliant, uh, everybody was great. And then we went down to the under the stage, um, and as you went down the corridor, you felt the whole thing go very cold, very dark, very black, more than I'd ever noticed before. I mean, normally spirit, um, when you feel a, an energy that, that gets cold or gets cold, what happens is they are feeding on your heat. So that's where you get the cold spot. Uh, but for a whole corridor to do it, that's a, you're talking at a more powerful presence there. You're talking at you know a higher level. So as we went down under this uh, under the stage, uh, Simon began to film, and R just plopped him down in the corner, and he would just go click of a finger into somebody else, um, and he turned into this guy. So I know why you're here don't want you here, um, I'm keeping lots of spirits against their will, and you're not gonna, you're not gonna do anything. So as I talked to him, um, I was on a, another conscious level rescuing the soul. So when I finished distracted talking to him, he realized that all the power he had had, had left, and it was just a distraction technique. So I said to him, where's, where's all your buddies gone? Um, and there's, I don't know if you, you may have seen the footage of this, I don't know, um, some people have, some people haven't. And what happened was, his whole demeanour, his whole body changed, and he just attacked me. Yeah, you froze them, you've just, you've just come back, so that's great. Is this yes. the video where the guy literally, and he kind of turns his neck, that's, that's the one? That's yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's, it's just, it is like something out of the movie, you know, it really is, yeah. And, yeah. and basically, so we... You stopped using that footage, didn't you? Sorry? You actually decided to stop using that footage, didn't you, from the first time I saw your presentation to the second time? Yeah, I stopped using it in the end, yeah. Um, yeah. Because you are giving that energy um to the audience and um that's not a good thing not a good thing so anyway uh, yeah we we wrestled uh, across the the floor full-on fight as you've seen um i only knew one chant and i can't even tell you what the chant was but i only knew one indian release chant and i just knew it in my head and i chanted and chanted and chanted um there was a loud he sort of roared and fell to the floor um, and went down as you've seen like a sack of spuds um, and that was that was the key moment for me I was shook I was shaking for about three hours after um, and I, the next morning I thought 
you were very lucky to come out of that. Very lucky. I, I need to up my game again. And then the back of my head was, you've got, you've got to learn exorcism. You must learn exorcism now. I don't know where it came from. I thought, but what, how can I find an exorcist? I, you know, how on earth can I find an exorcist? So I looked at Hindu exorcism. I looked at Christian um, exorcism. I looked at Buddhist exorcism. So I typed in the search bar. Uh, this organization came up, made contact with this organization. Uh, and they basically wanted to know everything about me. So for the next six weeks, once a week, I would tell them every, you know, a, a little, little bit about my journey, just pretty much like I've done here. And eventually he invited me over um, to Denmark to begin the training. Uh, and in the meantime, they started sending me um, what's called an exorcism kit. And the exorcism kit is a, a piece of tech, well, it's not a piece of technology. It's a, it's a piece of uh, knowledge that gives you the ability to prepare yourself for the teachings. It doesn't actually teach you itself. So from that that moment, um, I was um, just on a, a different level, and the things that I was learning and looking at were were pretty sort of serious. And then we were. Oh, I was invited to Denmark. Um, which was a a ride in itself because I, I as you know, uh, I turned up to Denmark, not didn't know any of these people, um, transported to this forest in the middle of nowhere. It was about two foot of snow. Uh, walked into the dojo, uh, and the grandmaster said, "Oh, welcome, Mr. Devlin. I'm not going to slow down this boot camp for you. You're here, and that's your decision." And with that, he then stripped naked. And got everybody else to strip naked as well. I was like, I've just come off a plane. What on earth have I got myself into? And we were all told to go outside, roll in the snow, break ice vats and pour water over us. I'm shanty, I'm shanty and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I remember him saying, yeah, this is good, Paul. This is good. What do you think of this, Paul? This is good. This is real Buddhism. Yeah, this is exorcism. And I just, I just did it. I just got on with it. Um, and I'd be quite happy now to do a talk completely naked because I've experienced that. It doesn't affect me in any way, shape or form. It's only it would affect, it would only um, offend others, not me, because they're not in the right place. So I'm all right with it. Um, and from that moment on, the training that I received was very intense. Some are very scary, some are very upsetting but it was a necessary course to take because it would help me and still is helping me now on helping people that have become um, possessed or, you know, impure, whatever you want to call it. So it was a, a life-changing thing at the Wyvern Theatre. And again, you have that path and then two years on, I was um, ordained as a Buddhist priest and fully ordained um, Buddhist exorcist, which is where we are now. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's funny because you, you never know where your life's going to take you. Um, never say never. And now I'm out of, should we say, the rat race. You know, I don't have to get up every morning, nine to five, and do all these different things, you know, um, you must go out and do this, you must go and do that. Because I have faith in my abilities. Um, I may not have the, the fanciest car, the fanciest house, but I'm very, I'm at peace with what I'm doing and the fact that I'm helping people as well. And it's a specialist subject, you know, and I understand that you, normally you're the last line of defence when you're called on because they've tried the doctors, they've tried all the therapies. Um, you are the last one, and that's fine. It just gives me an opportunity to show people that, in my experience, these things are real, you know, and the people that is affected will turn around and say the same things as well. They have an ability 
to manipulate so many things and that just doesn't go for the individual um i'm sure your listeners would be interested to know that that goes right up to um government parliament big corporations that have the ability to control that are being controlled by other forces um it's not just about individual possession and then of course you have the other side of exorcism and demonics where you have the physical side of a demon and the emotional side of a demon which are very very different thank you brother. what can you um <clears throat> excuse me what can you uh, tell us about this kind of physical side what were you alluding to there if you would right yeah yourself. sure um physical demon is uh an actual being there are there are beings which have that physical presence they have the ability to appear they have the ability they're not ghosts they're not spirits um they normally come from dim different dimensions um and they they come to this planet the first time i experienced anything like that i did a um i think it was a, a rescue in south oxfordshire somewhere and under the house again i've got a picture of this there was a footprint in the sand and the been locked under the house for a long time they'd had loads of stuff happening demonic stuff happening there was a footprint in the sand which i can only describe with no animal i've ever seen it was totally totally not animal of this world that's for sure um but it wasn't in, it, it was a it was a an imprint of sorts and not just one two or three and it's a case of when you take on these physical demons they're the ones that could quite easily kill you and um, so you have to be fully aware fully confident in yourself without being egotistical on how to deal with them um, and how to dissolve them or negotiate with them because again i'm not here to just turn around and say oh you know i've got the right to take you out yeah, yeah. it's not their fault that's who they are. They're a demonic. They're, they are demons. That's it. That's their purpose. And, you know, it's like people saying, you know, you're born a human, so I'm going to kill you. Well, it's not my fault I was born a human. I was born a human. That's it. And the same with the demonic force. You don't, people again have this real bad, um, you know, earworm technique that, that sticks in their mind that says, they're all bad, it's all evil, it's all, you know, they're here to deliberately do it to me. Well, they're not, you know, I'm sorry to disappoint people, but they're not. If there is a way to avoid the dissolve, then I will avoid it. But very rarely is there a way to avoid it. They are here to advance to a different level. Um, and they want to advance as high as they can. To as many levels uh, i know the wizard said there's only three levels in his in his realm in mine there's more than 20. so it doesn't really matter what level they are they have the intent to take life disrupt life destroy families and it can go right back to time it can go back if, if it first started in a family in the 1800s it'll keep going until they're stopped um, so the physical side of it is much more dangerous, much more dangerous than the emotional side of it. The emotional side of it is, um, we are all, if you use the word, we're all healers. Um, some people would say doctors, whatever you want to call it. And we have the ability to heal ourselves. But when we don't heal ourselves all the stresses and strains of life that come on top of us become a taint and a taint is a negative blob of energy that will stick to you. And if you get so many or a certain amount of these taints, um, they form a consciousness together. So they kind of, uh, become one, um, soul, if you like, that will then make its way to your belly button. So your belly button is the most vulnerable part of the body make it so it becomes a succubus and this is another thing i want to i want to i want to tell people incubus and succubus does not mean male and female and they do not mean sex demons it is a load of rubbish 
these people talk about this it's a load of rubbish the amount of people turn around to me i've got a succubus a succubus demon a demon does not care what sex you are a demon does not care what religion you follow it does not care what football team you support or what you like to eat if a demon is going to infect you it will infect you it, it there is no preference for it at all so when it sucks succubus is it sucks from your belly button so it sucks the energy to grow and feed itself and then when it becomes an incubus it breaks the skin and goes inside you so it then goes through your central nervous system and once it's nested in there it then becomes an incubus so it's incubating within yourself okay so when you are an when you're incubated, you normally have about two years to try and get this thing out. If after two years, it's not done, everybody's different, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit less. It then gets the state of a minor demon. And when it hits that state, then they are very, very difficult to pull out. If you pull out it, a minor demon state, um, powerful demon, um, then you will probably kill the person. So, and this is the other thing, just because don't be fooled by the word minor, because a minor demon on this earth plane is the most powerful thing you'll ever come across. Um, when I use that, I've been used to dealing with demons in other dimensions, because in order to tackle demons, the real powerful ones, you have to go to them so they don't get the chance to come to this level so you have to travel dimensionally and take them out because if you don't do it then they can attack to you when you astral travel so that's why it's very important when people astral travel that they protect themselves because a demon will see that ride the back of it and you'll be infected so it's very important that people use protection on all levels um, when, when dealing and exploring in, a, in spiritual or supernatural realms. Um, the other thing I want to say, Jimmy, is especially about supernatural, we all have the ability to be supernatural healers. We all have that ability to be, um, have supernatural powers. We choose not to. Um, it's only our human consciousness that stops us or society says we can't do this you know you you must do that it's you can't be allowed to do it or don't be silly that's a load of rubbish doesn't exist what i will say to people again it's very very important you know when you experience these things then it becomes a real it's the real deal you know um that's very important yeah Until thank you for that I was just going to say there, I think uh, for a lot of these things, until you've had that first-hand experience of whatever it is, is sometimes just to just be that one catalyzing event. And I think for a lot of people, they will have the catalyzing event that allows their own personal consciousness perspective to shift or change. And they might not even share it with another human being for years and years and years. Go, oh, that happened to me once, but I never told anyone because why would you, you know, certain experiences. Um, and as you say about the, the healing ability within, within, within all of us, there's nothing that nobody else can do that I can't do. Or there's nothing that nobody else can do for me that I can't do for myself. You just need to be shown the way or, you know, rediscover these kind of uh, talents within us, which I think brings us nicely onto what your kind of your most recent endeavor, not the podcast, we'll get to that at the very end, but the, the, the work that you're doing now with um, corporations, etc. I think brings us on nicely to that Paul do you think do you think yeah yeah absolutely um, I mean the the work that I'm doing at the moment with corporations is very energetically based a lot of corporations have a lot of issues with their staff at the moment because it's quite controlling it's quite um, highly stressed uh, a lot of companies now are, are waking up to the fact that if they get somebody in that isn't you know a therapist that's done 10 years in university that that's kind of been brainwashed into a certain way of doing things um to have a, a fresh new age approach on things 
does make a difference. So my job is to go into corporations, change the energy of, of places, change people's mindset on how they can be more positive and how um, it doesn't just have to be about yourself. Um, and changing people's fears and emotions and helping them so they don't have to go to work fearing when they walk through the door um, and being open and honest. So um, some take it better than others, but I think it's an important thing to understand that when you work with corporations, to be honest with them. And again, I normally do things called lunch and learns. So people will sit around the table. I'll, I'll give my talk. They'll look at each other and go, what the hell is this guy talking about? But when you do some of the exercises and they experience it for themselves, uh, for example, we do a, um, I, I do a, a, a water taste test. So you have two glasses of water. So right, what's your favorite fruit? Most people say strawberry. Um, it can be any fruit, wherever your favorite fruit is. Um, and then you taste the first glass of water. So you take your, your sip of water and you confirm it tastes like water. And then you get your other glass and you imagine the biggest, fattest, roundest, most juiciest strawberry you have ever bitten into. And then you will yourself strawberry, strawberry, strawberry. And you intensify that flavor within your mind. And then you take your other sip of water and nine times out of 10 people will fall off their seat and go, wow, it tastes like strawberry. And then you go back to your normal, your taster of normal water, taste it again and go, wow, that's really water. Well, so is that. It's just how you're, again, people turn around and say it's supernatural. It isn't supernatural. I can do it. You can do it. There's another one we do with a penny. I can dip it in cold water, but this hot, this water is lukewarm, hold the penny, all oh, the pennies lukewarm. To the point you have to be very careful how you do it, because if you make the, the mind think that the water's too hot, they will actually burn themselves. I've had it where they drop the penny, but they can do it. So it's about changing people's mindset, You'd, using a little um, bit of Buddhist intent, um, a little bit of spiritual enlightenment, just to make work for these people a little bit lighter. So by going in and that then stops them being off sick. If you're off sick, you're not just off sick for a couple of weeks. You're normally off sick for six months, maybe a year. So by changing mindsets and me going into those corporations and sitting in, our, in an office once a month in the morning, people could come to me and talk to me. And that helps corporations. It saves them a lot of money. I mean, it's, I think the last year, a year before corporations in the UK lost 20 billion pounds to people being off sick just through stress. So changing mindset is really important and doing it in a spiritual enlightened way is becoming more and more acceptable in society, which is a fantastic thing. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Um, uh, <clears throat> I was kind of, it seems to be we're going through this transitional period and things are kind of changing for the better. And I'm, I keep saying it lately, there's never been a better time to be alive, Paul. You know, there are some shenanigans afoot and there's some, you know, bullshit going on. But put all that to one side, there's never been a better time to be alive. And it's, it's because of that thing that I've been able to do this podcast. And you've just, I think you've just completed season one, right? Season two yeah. in the pipeline. Yeah, season two has just been re released. Um, the day the X is called, uh, which we release, uh, well, oh, it was being released on Facebook. But um, talking oh, about yes. corporations. So, 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 tell us a bit about the old, uh, what did they say to you? They've removed your links and what was the reason? Yeah, malicious, uh, spreading malicious content. Lovely. So all these people, you know, uh, sharing ISIS videos and all the rest of it. They just, they, they're fine. They seem to be all good, good yeah, to go. Exactly. But uh Share your own personal life story of um, self-discovery and helping others, plus malicious content. All right, Facebook. Yeah. Good work. Get on yeah, on. we're up against it. We know that. But, you know, I think Facebook now is pretty much the, I consider it on a par with the BBC, and I think a lot of people are the same. And there are so many alternatives. At the moment, there seems to be 
um, as an alternative to YouTube. Um, I, I use YouTube for now. It seems to be okay. I know they are um, they are restricting subscribers. They're restricting views. They've been doing that for a long time. That's nothing new. Um, we've got BitChute as an alternative. Um, there's another one called Brighteon, which was mentioned. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but um, Yes, I will put the links in the description box for the day the eggs just came. I think is it how many episodes is it, Paul? Is it ten? Yeah, ten episodes. Uh, we just series two is another ten episodes, and we've just released the first one, which was uh, the ship's clock, um, which is you can actually see the video to that, which is on uh, Ghost Medics Universe um, page on on Facebook, and I'm also I've just released. I'm going to be doing a um, a webinar on the 8th of February, which is like an open discussion group for people who want to talk about supernatural stuff. But it's, every, it's not just all about me. I want everybody to join in. I want everybody to uh, connect with me and together we can help solve other people's issues. Uh, so it's, it's a very um, interactive way of helping everybody. Um, so I'm just putting that platform out there, which we're going to start um, in about a month's time, which is fantastic. Wonderful, beautiful. Thank you, brother. And I will put the links for all that in the description box. And um, if the um, if the webinar addresses are not ready quite yet, we will um, we'll do a little short one just before that, so we can remind people. What that's because I'm yeah, sure there will be plenty of people. Who I'm in. also doing a talk uh, for those who are interested. I'm also doing a, t an, a talk on exorcism uh, in Swindon um, on the 25th of March. But I'll give you all the details for that. Wonderful, wonderful. Where's that going to be, Paul, in Swindon? Uh, where? Yeah. Um, West Swindon at Trans End. Oh, beautiful. All right, we'll, yeah. we'll put the links for all that in the description box. Oh, well, fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, you know, Paul and I are obviously friends in the, the real world, but it's been nice yeah. to kind of converse for the podcast and kind of share Paul's story because it's, it's, it's just superbly unique, you know. Is it, are we still fair to say you are the only Buddhist exorcist in the UK still, Paul? Or yeah. yeah, no, still there. And um, I think it's fair to say, Paul, hoping for, you know, the next generation to start coming through and kind of, um, you know, learning more. I think that webinar, I think, will be very instrumental in kind of uh, bringing people to the fold to kind of uh, see where we go next with all this kind of stuff that's going on. So, yeah, thank you very much. I think, I think the important thing is if, if anybody's interested um, in uh, training uh, to be an exorcist, uh, I, the organisation that I, that I carry and involved in, I'm, I'm the head or chief trainer of over 20,000 um, students. So I, I, I'm chief exorcist trainer. So if anybody's interested and would like to get more information, um, then, you know, there's a big call out there um, for Buddhist exorcists, for people, especially in the UK. Um, so I'm always, always happy to um, extend my knowledge and share my knowledge. Wonderful. You're an absolute gentleman, brother. Thank you very much. And I think... Was there anything else to round off to, Paul, or have we covered it all nicely? I think we're, I think we're all there. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, let's have a look. It's, uh, oh, I think that's about 90 minutes. Lovely. Well, that's gone really quick, actually. I didn't even think that's of it. That, huh? oh, well, that's always the way, isn't it, when you're having fun? But uh, thank you again, brother. Much appreciated. And I'm sure we will uh, we'll reconnect in the next couple of months and um, let people know where you're at. But uh, in the meantime, brother, stay safe and take care. And uh, you look after yourself and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you, brother. Take care. Yes. Speak to you soon. All Thanks. the best. Bye.